the opportunity here to talk to you guys today. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving and let's get started with my presentation here. So I've got a PowerPoint first to start us off. I'm gonna load this up. All righty. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah, we're good. All right, so this is an introdu introduction to osteopathic medicine. Andrew Taylor Still, this is the man right here. He came up with osteopathic medicine and osteopathic manipulation back in the 1800s during the Civil War era because he was really frustrated with medicine at the time. He was already a physician, but uh, was using a lot of drastic measures to heal his patients. Things like opium, calomel, arsenic, a lot of really intense uh, chemicals. And he felt this was doing a lot of harm to his patients. Um, and his kids actually died from uh, meningitis and he wanted to figure out a better, more natural way to heal the body. Um, and so he believed that many of these medicines were treating, were treating uh, side effects and creating side effects rather than treating the disease. And he thought that a rational medical treatment should consist of musculoskeletal manipulation and consider aspects of all things uh, the human being is comprised of. Uh, such as the mind, body, and spirit. So he found he could improve the central nervous system homeostasis via mus muscular techniques, muscle manipulation, and uh, he was quickly well known for this as being called the lightning bone setter. And this is one of his top quotes, I, in my opinion, uh, to find health should be the object of the doctor and anyone can find the disease. So, oops, there you go. So what does osteopathy mean? Or osteopathy, it means bone plus pathos or uh, the structure and alignment as the root cause of pathological conditions. And his goal is not to dispense medicine, but to become a healer and to correct things structurally via uh, human touch. And he wanted to really generate a self-healing mechanism. So this self-healing property would be enhanced by lymphatic drainage, uh, the autonomic nervous system, and eliminating myofascial restrictions of the body. So the four tenets of osteopathy that you learn as a DO student are human is a unit consisting of mind, body, and spirit. The body can heal itself via self-regulatory mechanisms and structure and function are interrelated. Uh, for example, chronically poor posture leading to chronic pain. So the rational osteopathic treatment requires all of these uh, approaches. So of course, there are two types of physicians in the US, um, being that there are DOs and there are MDs. And so I get asked this all the time, like what is the difference? Um, and uh, the difference is that we have this, for example, in this picture is a hands-on OMM lab and extra class and lecture work in osteopathic manipulation. But we get the same four-year medical training otherwise. We get all the same biochemistry, physiology, anatomy, everything is the same. So what is the real difference? Like in the real world, when you're done with residency, you're out and practicing, well, really the difference is that your underlying thought process and philosophy uh, might differ just because we get more of an emphasis on anatomy and structure and uh, an emphasis on primary care and healthy lifestyle it seems to be a bigger focus. But DOs have all been trained in manipulation. However, only about 90% use it frequently in practice. And there's many reasons for this. But just remember, all physicians are unique people and they have different skills, abilities, and interests. Um, so you can't really just pigeonhole DOs or MDs into one category. It's very multifaceted um, and everyone's unique. So. We can go into any medical specialty. The ones that I've kind of marked here are typically the ones that I find myself um, relating to more and referring patients to more than others. So what is OMT, osteopathic manipulative treatment? Well, that is a style of treatment using our hands about coordinating adjustment of living tissue, uh, fascia, bone, ligament, muscle, tendon, <laughs> even the visceral organs 
and based on the current state of the anatomy and physiology within the patient. So when you achieve proper alignment of these structures, the nervous system, the lymphatics, biomechanics, they're all optimized and you can then heal the root cause of an injury or a disease state. And this unwinding effect occurs. And typically after I treat a patient, they sleep like eight to 10 hours, like really heavy. And they're like, it's the best night of sleep I've had in a while. And again, that's because we're harnessing the power of the parasympathetic nervous system to heal the body. So after a bunch of treatments, you maintain this homeostasis and this balance uh, within the physiology of the person therefore increasing their expression of health. So we have this additional hands-on training where we diagnose what's called somatic dysfunction. That's what we entitle it when we're writing our notes and we're documenting and you want to relieve these dysfunctions to restore the normal function. So a lot of treatments consist of the traditional adjustments that people are very familiar with. Uh, however, there's tons of soft tissue techniques, myofascial techniques, counter strain, muscle energy, a lot of things you could see PTs doing um, that osteopathic doctors do as well. So we really combine a lot of different modalities. <clears throat> and, a, and a little fact here is that a lot of these modalities like chiropractic and other techniques actually stemmed out from uh, osteopathic origins. <clears throat> so I actually made this figure here because I get so many questions. How is chiropractic different than osteopathic? Well, here's some of the differences is that um, you have to go to medical school as an osteopathic doctor. Um, you focus on the body as a full unit. You treat somatic dysfunction and you use all of these various techniques. Chiropractic, you go to four years of chiropractic school. You have various types of chiropractors and you focus a lot of times just on the spine and you can treat subluxations. Um, <clears throat> and they also have their set of uh, of tools and techniques. And the only spot where we overlap are these manual adjustments of the spine. So some common outpatient things that I treat with OMT are of course back pain, neck pain, um, whiplash injuries, posture, car accidents and other traumas, um, and even concussions I use with cranial osteopathic manipulation. And infants actually do very well with this modality, especially after birth. In pregnancy, uh, females with low back pain from that, fibromyalgia, um, and that actually does really well with acupuncture, which I'll get into, and chronic regional pain syndrome, which is um, pretty hard to treat sometimes, and postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. So how can it be used inpatient? Well, we get consulted a lot for COPD, pneumonia, a lot of these lung diseases, and cardiovascular disease where you have a lot of uh, swelling and edema, such as CHF, and especially in post-surgical patients with bowel stasis. Um, one of the major criteria to leave the hospital is have they moved their bowels. And a lot of times, because the autonomic nervous system is in such a state of shock after surgery, we have to get the body moving again using these gentle techniques and addressing the autonomics so that they can get rebalanced and have these normal bodily functions. So my style specifically includes other things as well that I've kind of brought into my toolbox over the years. Uh, functional movement screens, exercise, I'm really passionate about fitness um, and nutrition as well as supplementation. And uh, I've done research on the Hypervolt, which is becoming pretty big, um, Graston, Gua Sha, Cupping, uh, medical acupuncture, and my latest thing I've brought in are regenerative-based uh, injection treatments like prolotherapy and PRP. Now, what is acupuncture? So here's another aspect of what I do. So acupuncture is a form of treatment that involves inserting these very, very thin dissecting needles through a person's skin at various points of the body to various depths with various inputs. Right, so you have a lot of variability with what you do with these needles. And the word actually comes from the French Jes Jesuits uh, and the Latin uh, arcus and punctura. So uh, needles and to puncture. And historically, um, this was the first kind of notation of acupuncture um, in the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine about 10, uh, 100 BC. 
and uh, historians think that it might, might even originate uh, 600 years BC. And there's a lot of hieroglyphs and pictographs from that area suggesting acupuncture and moxibustion were practiced. Uh, moxibustion is the um, igniting of moxa, which, which is a type of uh, herb that you use a lot with acupuncture to generate heat, therefore to stimulate the body for healing. And uh, the first acupuncture needles were actually like bone and bamboo and um, you know, a lot of these really kind of sharp objects, not, not as good as stainless steel like we use nowadays, but that's where it started. So by the end of the Song Dynasty, actually, acupuncture actually lost a lot of its status um, for a few hundred years. But in 1800s, the Chinese emperor at the time actually wanted to um, uh, exclude it from the practice of uh, from from the practice of medicine at the Imperial Medical Institute. But France actually early was an early adopter of the uh, acupuncture in the West because of these missionaries who brought it back to the French clinics during this era. And chi in China, acupuncture actually rebounded in popularity when Mao Zedong took power and wanted. Uh, to unite China behind its traditional uh, cultural values, therefore creating a lot of barefoot doctors <clears throat> who used acupuncture in the field. So uh, acupuncture really blossom blossomed in France during the 1900s. Um, and uh, Dr. Paul Noget began uh, mapping points on the ear uh, in the 1950s, according to um, his clinical practice. And now it's being verified with fMRI studies. Uh, but then the U.S. military started using battlefield acupuncture uh, in its uh, practice. So Dr. Joe Helms, who uh, I studied under, he brought French uh, acupuncture to the U.S. at the Helms Medical Institute, and uh, which is where I trained in my fellowship. And one of the main uh, things that brought acupuncture popularity to the U.S. was this 1971 New York Times uh, article by James Reston, where he actually had an appendicitis and had his appendix removed in Beijing, and they used acupuncture as part of the surgical pre and post operative protocol and for anesthesia. So, for here's the article in the New York Times talking about his uh, operation. And what are meridians and what are acupuncture points? So these are points of high electrical conductance in the body uh, because of these high density of gap junctions and therefore decreased electrical resistance. We're getting to our, uh, our electrophysiology here along these fascial planes. The electrical conductance through these planes actually connects specific anatomical points of the fascia, which can then be uh, stimulated and they can be tonified or dispersed. Uh, there are about 365 points on the body, each with, with their own name, function, lore, and connections to various systems, uh, symptoms rather, that humans experience. Here is a quick example of the body meridians as it applies to the human anatomy. And because of you know, translation and the language barriers, um, they are named after specific uh, dense organ structures and can correspond to those organs. Uh, however, a lot of times uh, they might not completely correspond to that organ. So it's more of just the name of that meridian um, and it just helps to remember these. So an acupunctured needle itself, and there are many, many types as you can see, they have a very low risk of infection because they are not, they are dissecting needles, they are not hollow. So it's very difficult for there to be inoculation of bacteria with a dissecting needle because there's less surface area. They're also made of various materials which allow for different treatment inputs. Um, and some are coated with silicon for a smoother insertion. This, these are known as sarin needles. And the goal is to really create an electric current and ionic flow through various um, uh, tissues of the body. And you also um, only use sterile needles nowadays. They used to autoclave needles, but now uh, all, all needles are individually packaged and sterilized. And I can show you an example of that after the lecture here. And here's the mechanism of action. So you have the insertion of the needle that actually creates this mast cell 
um, degranulation and changes neural inputs to the brain. And there's a lot of uh, localized irritation of the tissue, which then drives healing. So that's kind of a quick um, methodology behind it. All right, so here are the different inputs that uh, you can do. So you can actually manually twist the needle to create tonification and that'll aggravate the um, myofascia beneath it. And just think of it as you're putting a fork into a bunch of spaghetti, right? You're, you're sticking it in, things are grabbing that metal and you're twisting it around and you're actually creating uh, local irritation, you're creating um, recruitment of fibroblasts and just changes in the physiology. And you can also do moxibustion, which is at the bottom left here, that you're actually um, adding heat to the needles which delivers more stimulation uh, internally. And what I use the most is electricity on the bottom right. So you can connect electrical leads to the body and then stimulate based on the Hertz frequencies, a more anesthetic based treatment versus um, a more um, deep release of the muscle if you have a muscle spasm. And you can tune the electrical inputs to release various endorphins and enkephalins and endogenous opiates in the body to relieve pain. And when I also learned acupuncture, we talked about the five element theory. And this gets to a more functional medicine based approach where um, you have all of these different types of individuals. And if you're interested, this is a book that Dr. Helms wrote about kind of knowing yourself, knowing your patients on a deeper level, um, what, what people gravitate to if they're more of, let's say, a kidney type of individual and what problems they're more prone to versus someone who's got like a very fiery personality or who might be more of a heart type of individual. So these actually also correspond to various meridians. And over time, clinically, you can find that uh, you can read people very quickly based on what they have a history of and then what they're prone to and actually prevent a lot of uh, incoming medical problems based on your knowledge. So here's a quick little case about what I would use acupuncture for. Um, you have a 72 year old female with a meniscal tear and osteoarthritis in the knee. Um, she has hypertension, hyperlipidemia. The pain has been going for three months and it started after walking a lot on her vacation. Uh, the x-ray shows just mild osteoarthritis and the physical exam is positive for medial knee tenderness on the right and the McMurray's test which is a meniscal irritation uh, test. And she's received a steroid injection with mild relief and is continuing to do physical therapy. Currently her pain is a seven out of 10 and was a three out of 10 after the injection. So here is a periosteal knee stimulation for acute knee pain. So these uh, coils here are where, and, and the ST34 and SP10, these are the names of the specific points. So stomach 34 and spleen 10. Um, and so what I would do is do OMT for about 10 minutes. You balance out the anatomical structures of the knee. Uh, you uh, allow the ligaments to relax. You also want to work on the muscular attachments, perhaps using a hypervolt or um, some soft tissue techniques. And then I would do acupuncture on the knee with this setup. And the po uh, minus to positive shows the electrical current distribution. You always want to use a negative current on um, a periosteal point because it's just more powerful, delivering more electrons to that tissue. And uh, after 20 minutes, the patient went from a seven out of 10 to a zero out of 10. And the relief lasts for about two plus weeks and you stimulate at a hundred Hertz for 20 minutes. Um, this is actually based on a, a real case that I had and I continue to see her and actually do uh, injections not steroid injections, but more prolotherapy and regenerative PRP injections for her knee. So that is the end of my little brief presentation here. Now we can get into to some more Q&A stuff, which I actually like a lot. And um, here's my Instagram if you wanna DM me. And also uh, I'm de debuting a new YouTube video tonight at five. So just type, type in my name into YouTube, send me a follow. I started my channel this week. So any, uh, any help with that is appreciated. Um, and that is about it. So if you want to screenshot that, 
Thank you so and much. This was such a helpful presentation. Yeah. A lot of um, yeah, no problem. A lot of people were saying that you really taught them a lot and um, just things that they weren't, they didn't know the differences about between DO and acupuncture. So thank you so much for explaining those to us. Um, yeah. So I can go in, let's see, get some questions today. There was a question asking if you could kind of go over the naturopathic medicine route, um, like just depending on how much you know about, is it similar to DO or is it just not an accredited form of medicine and what your thoughts are on it? Yeah, I actually um, have a couple of friends who uh, went the ND route. So I believe that is also a four year training. Um, however, in the US, the only uh, physicians who are able to do things like surgeries and all of that um, are DOs and MDs. Um, however, I, I truly believe that there is a role for NDs to play and that they do amazing, amazing work. Um, they are just more focused on uh, much more natural based things, I would suppose like herbs and things like that. But um, yeah, that's, I don't know too much about the ND route. I do know, I think it's a four year education and there's some really great schools and practitioners out there. So um, if that's something you're interested in, I would just recommend um, maybe messaging an ND or, or just researching it um, because there are certainly some really great ones out there, yeah. Great, thank you for that clarification. There was also yeah. several questions asking about how osteopathic medicine, how closely it correlates to PMNR and PT. So do you yeah. particularly work with a lot of um, PMNR physicians or PTs? And if you could just kind of talk on your experience. Yeah, so it's funny you say that because PMNR was actually the initial specialty I was interested in. Um, I actually talked about that in my YouTube video tonight. So the, the one that's premiering is called Why I Chose OMM. Gets more into my background of how I got to this point. Um, but, but yeah, so physiatry uh, is certainly runs in tandem with what I do. And actually one of my residency uh, mentors, Dr. Levin, he was a PM&R resident at Jefferson, did a fellowship in OMM and uses both his physiatry training and OMM training in his practice. Um, and it totally overlaps. Like I, I had a huge interest in physiatry going through medical school. Uh, I just decided to go OMM because I wanted uh, just a more robust OMM training. And, um, and I was a little more interested in uh, like acupuncture and, and cupping and herbs and just a little bit different of a background. But uh, physiatry definitely uses, there are a lot of uh, acupuncturist, physiatrists out there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it certainly is something that is very similar to what I do. Uh, but I think what I do is a little bit more maybe outside the box, so to speak. Yeah, that's awesome, though. Um, we had a few questions asking about using acupuncture for um, maternal or maternity acupuncture and if that's something that you do or if it's like a completely different situation. Yes, we do have uh, fertility treatments here at the office. So a lot of times uh, women who have uh, difficulty getting pregnant um, benefit from acupuncture because the, the real reason underlying a lot of infertility is an imbalance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So if you're able to allow the body to become more parasympathetically um, uh, stimulated, that can just create a better internal milieu and environment for pregnancy to occur. So when we do have a pregnancy um, or fertility treatment in the office, we tell, we actually text everyone via our, our Zoom chat, like, hey, make sure it's really quiet in the office. Um, we have a pregnancy treatment going, um, it's in room two. Uh, and we'll be very aware of that because you just want it to be as uh, calming as possible. But there are definitely certain points on the body that can help um, with, with fertility. That's awesome. Yeah, one of my cousins did that. It was really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, we also had a question that was asking about um, for are all the points the same across everyone or are they going to vary? on an individual basis? Great question. Uh, I would say they definitely vary because 
the points that you learn are more of a guideline. And this goes for any type of medicine, right? Like you learn, you learn the academia, you learn the textbook stuff, but the body doesn't read the textbook, right? Like each person is an N of one and you have to really respect like how their own body reacts to certain medications, to certain weather patterns, states of mind, stressors, like all of these things. And um, that's why my foundation in, uh, in manual treatments and palpation is so important because you can then learn exactly where that point is on that person um, based on your palpatory findings on your exam, because then you'll never be lost. Like you could just treat purely based on palpation and actually like forget all the points. And if you're treating based on what you're feeling, you'll pretty much be dead on for that person uh, when you're taking the acupuncture point. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. That's good advice going forward in medicine that everyone's different. <laughs> I think we need to remember that all the time. Yeah. Um, there was a really good question asking if you could give a personal example of how being a DO, how that expertise adds to or can potentially add to um, just things that you do in your practice. Yeah, I think being a DO is actually um, why I am doing what I do, period. Because if I didn't go to a DO school, I wouldn't have figured out anything or learned osteopathic manipulation, which is like one of my biggest passions now and is, is how I actually begin with every new patient. I begin with a full osteopathic uh, structural exam and, and diagnosis and, and treatment. Because for me, it's like it's hard to separate the diagnostics and the treatment side. Because let's say I, I diagnose um, a right innominate anterior rotation with a longer leg on the right side, I'll diagnose it and then fix it immediately because I'm like, I'm already here, I'm going to fix it. And so um, the osteopathic um, foundation in my mind is like the main foundation. And then off of that, I built my medical acupuncture approach foundation and off of knowing the needle depths and the safe areas in the anatomy of, of how you work with needles, I built the injection-based treatments. So it's really like, in my mind, a, a tiered system of knowledge and philosophy, but really the philosophy is, is based on the osteopathic tenets that the body can self-heal, structure and function are related, um, and that we are one unit of mind, body, and spirit that all needs to be addressed. So um, yeah, that's, that's how the, being a DO really influences what I do. And then, so Chelsea had a really good question in the chat and she asked, oftentimes I hear that MD physicians get offended when people say that, quote, DO physicians practice more holistically compared to them, end quote. So since the holistic pr perspective is very important for the DO profession, what advice do you give future or potential DO students in explaining that without offending their MD counterparts? Yeah, I totally agree because, um, that's why I put the little asterisk where we, we have this training. However, everyone is their own individual. I know tons of MDs who are way more osteopathic than a lot of DOs that I know. And it's just interesting because like Dr. Joe Helms, who um, taught the acupuncture fellowship, I asked him, you know, or someone asked her like, Dr. Helms, would you have been a DO if like you knew about it? And he's like, yeah, I would have because, you know, it's, it fits in. I palpate, I do acupuncture. He's like, it would have been a great foundation for me, but I just didn't realize, you know, or know about it enough back in the day. So um, certainly I would say that MDs are extremely well-trained. It's just might not be as emphasized in the training, the, the holistic nature of the body. However, they certainly learn that, you know, in some form or fashion, whether they're in their residency learning that through, um, you know, being at clinic or just, you know, practicing for a long time, because um, I would just say in DO school, it's just like way more emphasized because it's one of the founding tenets of our education is that we are mind, body, and spirit. And that's really just about it. So, um, and when you're, when you're interacting with other professionals like MDs versus DO, you actually don't really even know un unless you want to investigate. Um, certainly in, in my acupuncture class, there's 30 physicians. I was one of five DOs, but like you would never know just talking from one doctor to the other that they were, there are even some dentists who were in there um, that I was, that they just seemed like another doctor. So it's like, 
I would say it only becomes a thing or becomes an issue if in your mind you make it that way, uh, you know, and in practice, it really, you know, it really isn't a big deal. Yeah, I've definitely heard that, you know, no one really asks where you went to school and like which path you went on. They no, just care about you if you're taking care of them. So that's awesome. Um, we had a few yeah. people actually ask um, about if the treatment is going to last um, like two weeks, would you be seeing these patients regularly or um, like every few months or, you know, how often would you be seeing them and, you know, when would it, you know, cease? That's a great question. And the answer is it depends 100% on that specific case. Um, there are cases where I've treated them one time and they've never had to come in again because that resolved their issue. Then there are patients who prefer to see me like religiously every two to four weeks because they know if they see me, I'll be able to pick up on just that initial deviation from the norm for their health and then course correct and bring them back on track. So it, it depends on that person's uh, physiology, how well they heal, um, the chronicity of their illness. It depends on um, you know, how proactive and preventative they want to be. Because some people are fine with just breaking down, getting treated one or two times, and then they're fine. And then a year later, they, they get that breakdown again. Um, some people just never want to go down that path and just are able to see me consistently every month. Um, and yeah, so it really depends on the case. I would say for, for that case I talked about, that was like a case of stage four, like bone on bone osteoarthritis that really will only be 100% fixed possibly by a knee replacement, but they're seeing me as like a palliative measure, so to speak, um, which is of course a tougher case uh, for what I do non-surgically. Uh, so yeah, it, it really depends on the person, but like a lot of times people can, can be like fixed, quote unquote, um, with one to three treatments. However, life happens and everything is fluid, always changing, always evolving. So like I've, I've some Murphy's Law patients, like if anything bad will happen, it probably will for that person, unfortunately. So like this one patient, one time she'll come to me for like her knee is really bothering her. Then the next time it's her neck and her back because she was driving a lot. Then then it's like a fall on her tailbone because she was carrying laundry down the stairs. So like you will have these different types of patients where you'll one person you'll see once a year and then one person you'll see every two weeks. So it really is variable. Yeah, of course. And I'm sure that changes for every specialty too. So um, we had a lot of people ask about um, if, if and how. Uh, acupuncture can help with any psychological disorders, mental disorders, anxiety, depression, stuff like that. Yeah, 100%, 100%, because um, the mind, body, and spirit are all this one unit. So when you affect certain areas of, of the anatomy and physiology, you're going to be changing feedback uh, to consciousness and brain tissue. So for example, um, the emotional correlates of stress and anxiety Look at the upper anterior fibers of the trapezius right here and the suboccipital region. Typically people who have a lot of problems in those areas are dealing with a lot of emotional uh, stress, um, whether it's from uh, work or whether it's from like studying or learning. Uh, and when you treat those areas, sometimes people have like an emotional release, um, especially when you treat with uh, auricular acupuncture, when you do points in the ear, these specific points on the ear have been shown by fMRI studies to, to correspond as points on the brain. Uh, for example, uh, for battlefield acupuncture, the reason it's called battlefield acupuncture is because medics have been trained, and this is in the US military, this is currently being used, um, to, to put in ear needles after someone has had a concussion, after someone is dealing with some PTSD because of some acute trauma. Um, and uh, all of these things will then affect um, you know, the amygdala, they'll affect, uh, you know, the, the brainstem, all of these areas that are involved with conscious processing, the cerebral cortex. So um, certainly acupuncture is a way, relatively non-invasive way, non-pharmaceutical way 
to influence the, the spirit, the, the mind, and therefore the connections to the body and vice versa. So yeah, hundred percent. Thank you for answering that. I think a lot of times we'll forget that our mind, body, spirit, so everything's yeah. connected. So yeah. there was several questions asking how COVID has impacted your practice because you know, OMM and acupuncture is really hands-on, you're touching the person. So how mm -hmm. has yeah. your practice um, specifically been affected? Great question. So we actually uh, created this whole protocol now where after each patient um, enters and exits the room, everything, every surface is wiped down with uh, HOCL, which is like a more natural form of bleach, so to speak, and our bodies actually produce HOCL. So we use that um, to wipe down everything to sterilize it. And then um, I'm obviously wearing like an N95 and, and my patient's always wearing a mask as well. Um, and we also, after the day, we, we actually do what's called an ozone bomb, where we put in an ozonator in each clinic room and we seal the door and we actually pump ozone through the room for eight hours. And ozone actually kills any virus, bacteria, fungal pathogen, just about everything. Um, it kind of smells a little bit. So you just have to make sure people know it's being ozonated, but um, we go through a pretty intense steril sterilization procedure um, every day and after each patient. So that's the main thing. Plus we, we limit the amount of people in the room. So just like one other person can accompany a patient, but most of the times patients just come in, uh, it's just me and the patient. Um, and I actually get a COVID test every uh, couple of weeks, just, just for my own state of mind, like um, just so I can make sure everything's all good. Thank you for answering that. There was yeah. a question asking, and I think this is a really interesting question, since you do, you're focused on manipulation and acupuncture. So how often, if at all, do you prescribe medication and when do you decide to do that in your practice? I think in the last three years, I've prescribed medication once or twice. And one time it was for um, a Medrol dose pack because a patient had herniated their disc like that morning and was having a really intense uh, radiating radicular symptoms down the back of their leg um, where they couldn't like, couldn't even think straight. So I'm like, all right, we need to bring out the big guns for this. Just like take some steroid uh, PO just to get the neurogenic inflammation down because um, you do not want it to create weakness over time. And, um, and of course, like I'll prescribe physical therapy and imaging when necessary. However, um, really in the last six months, I don't think I prescribed anything once um, because the results that I get are, uh, I just don't need it. Um, I just, I, I address things through, through you know, sleep, uh, exercise, nutrition, supplementation. If those things aren't correct or, or not optimized first, why reach for a prescription pad? Like uh, that to me is, is just, uh, fundamentals of healthy living. So I wanna make sure they're living healthy first. And then if something really acute or if something else is necessary, that's when I start to think about it. But honestly, like a lot of these problems people have can be addressed via non-invasive and non-pharmaceutical modalities. Um, it's just, once you know how to do it, it's like, it's just a no brainer. And, and a lot of people see me because of that philosophy. That's so interesting. And I think you saw me and Lana, our eyes kind of got big. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people are just asking um, if there's a particular case that you always, uh, that just comes to your memory as your most interesting or most fun case. Yeah. Okay. So here's a case that Dr. Shin and I both kind of initially started working on in tandem. And this is near the, the more tail end of my residency, like in the last couple of weeks, um, we had a, a patient. So, so we do a lot of work with the Eagles, uh, the NFL team, and they're actually coming in right now. They're like outside my door lining up. But um, the one of like the veteran Eagles players, he's in his like 70s, 80s. Um, his wife has been having speech difficulties for a few years now, for about three years. And Initially, it started just her speech was slower. Then it was like she kept losing the ability to come up with certain words. 
then on the phone, she wasn't able to talk well on the phone and it became really bad. Um, and of course, she's, she went to Penn, she went to Jefferson, she got five MRIs, she's got PET scans, everything, everything, everything was negative. Like they were just trying to reach out for anything. They just couldn't figure it out. So she comes to see us obviously, cause uh, we, we treated one of her kids um, and they got really great results. And they were like, just send her here and figure out what we can do. So in just getting the history, right? And this is a big thing that I, I want to leave you guys with is like listening to the patient is not just listening and getting a history. A lot of times listening to the patient and hearing what they have to say without judgment is part of the healing process. It is part of the therapeutic process. It's uh, very important because you will learn some things and even the patient will learn some things about their disease process that no one has really addressed. For example, this patient, she was never asked about this. Like what exactly happened in her life three years ago as she started to lose her speech capability? Um, granted, people would often ask, did you hit your head? Did you have a car accident? Had be like very obvious, like physical based trauma to the, to the brain or to the, the mouth or something like that. No, 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 she didn't have any of that. However, when you go deeper, when you're like, what kind of emotional issues or what kind of big life changes did you have in your life? Um, she was like, well, my mother died and I was with her every day in the hospital for three weeks before she died. Um, and then at her mom's funeral, her brother collapses, goes to the ER and finds out he was diagnosed with colon cancer. So it's like, and then a few weeks after that, her speech started to go. So no one really connected the dots with that. And we were the first ones where she realized like there might be a connection there. Like literally no one asked about that stuff for her. So we actually started to unpack that in the office. And um, the route we went with it was not like an injection route, right? Because this wasn't like a tight muscle or something. This was like a, a spot of her mind that was stuck in this guilt and this turmoil and this like emotional kind of trapped issue. So we had her lie on her back. I was focusing on her cranium and this is where like the cranial osteopathy kind of like woo woo weird stuff comes in with like really tough cases like this. Um, so like I was on her head and feeling for the expansion and contraction of her, the bones of her skull. Um, and it literally just feels like this like ebb and flow of cerebrospinal fluid combined with respirations, combined with her, her circulatory system. Um, so again, it's like only I know what it feels like for me. It's like really hard to describe. But as Dr. Shin was then asking her more questions, he was taking acupuncture points in the ears that correspond with emotion. Um, and then he was also taking points on the body that correspond with that. So especially in this like diaphragm region here, um, and then points in the hands and the wrists and the feet. Um, and as he was taking those points and as he was asking her to, to think about her mom, think about her brother, think about what happened um, during that time in her life, he was asking me, he's like, Dr. King, what do you, do you feel a change with this point? And then he would take a point and then I would either not feel much of any change or I would feel everything clamp or I would feel things start to gain amplitude. And so with any point that started to gain her amplitude, I was giving feedback. I was like, yeah, that's a good point. Like take that one. Um, or uh, no, 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 take that out because she's clamping. Um, and so we got to a, a state where things were really opened up and she was actually like, looked up at me and she's like, can I just take you home? This is like amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and so she started to like open up and she actually, her, her speech started to improve just in that visit. Granted, it wasn't like she was totally back to normal, but we actually, we, we, we saw the little glimpse of the little, um, opening that we could take this further. Uh, and so she ended up going to her speech pathologist who she was working with. And we were working with the speech pathologist to get their kind of um, feedback on, okay, what words has she improved in? Uh, what speech patterns has she done well with? Um, and yeah, we've been just continuously treating her and seeing improvements. So, so a lot of times I see when the imaging is negative, 
a lot of doctors are like throw up their hands like i don't know what to do it's not there it's not on the image it's not on the labs it's not on this i'm like but something is really happening with this person so you that's when you think outside of the box and that's also when you realize the box doesn't even exist you just have to address that person both you know mental through through their physical body and through their actual spirit and how they participate in their experience of life and their consciousness like and that is where uh, medicine becomes an art form um so yeah that i think is one of the craziest cases i've seen in the last couple of years so that was so interesting everyone was amazed by that story and definitely took the message of mind over body um and there was a really interesting question um i guess kind of has two parts one is mm -hmm. um are there osteopathic sports medicine facilities all over the country? And is there, are there any resources to find one where we like throughout the country where we live nearby us? I think uh, always the best route to go is to look for the closest osteopathic medical school. Um, and then from there, typically they have a DO or an OMM department. And that's where you would find someone similar to what I do. Granted, a lot of uh, OMM doctors don't um, do acupuncture perhaps or, or injections. Um, however, that's like a good place to start. Uh, a lot of OMM physicians who do private practice have their own private cash-based practice like I have with Dr. Shin. Um, however, to be honest, like what we do is, is extremely unique. I don't know of anywhere else on the East Coast who treats with our combination or in the way that we treat. Uh, but certainly looking at a DO school is probably the first, first best place to initially look for an OMM doctor. Great, thank you. There was a lot of people yeah. that have been saying that um, they had never considered being a DO, but your talk today has really just gave them, given them a whole new perspective. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. There were some questions asking if you have ever treated or if it's even possible to treat Alzheimer's and dementia patients with acupuncture. And if yeah, I would say I would say it's similarly to that case where um, there's some kind of altered altered brain function or poor uh, neurological firing happening in the mind and brain. Um, certainly, every case is different, but. Uh, I have definitely seen functional improvements in chronic neurodegen neurodegenerative disease states with acupuncture. Um, and it's really simple because acupuncture, you just, if you take the right points, the body is smart enough to kind of figure it out and rebalance things and, and flourish. Uh, as long as you open the door for it to step through, then um, it's, it's not like crazy, crazy difficult. You just do your research look at other cases, look at what has worked with other uh, patients and, and talk to your colleagues. Like I have a couple acupuncture groups where we just meet and talk about cases we've had. Um, but, but I would certainly just give it a try because what's great about acupuncture is there's essentially just about zero side effects other than God forbid you puncture a lung and give someone a pneumo, but that doesn't happen super often. So, um, it can't hurt to try, right? So I'd give it, and I would give it a good couple tries because you know, you're know you not gonna be like magical and just fix Alzheimer's on one try, right? Um, but but certainly with, uh, with a nice combination of OMT and acupuncture, you could, could make some changes. And then I think this is a really interesting question. Someone asked from an osteopathic point of view, what are your personal views on diets like the keto diet and intermittent, intermittent fasting? Are they healthy but for the body or beneficial at all? Or do they just cause more harm than good? I think the most harm that's caused by diet is the mindset and the anxiety that is induced by not following a diet. Um, I would follow what's intuitive for your body. Like you really take stock of based on what I'm eating and how I eat, how do I actually feel? How do I function? Because a lot of people will put following the diet before their subjective experience of like how they feel with following the diet. And it's just not worth it for a lot of people. So I would just follow uh, what feels right for you in that time. So um, for example, for me, like I noticed, I just don't get hungry in the morning. So guess what? I'm not going to stuff myself because someone said, eating protein every two or three hours is like best for you if you want to gain muscle or like I'm, I'm going to listen to my body. Um, 
maybe I, I typically do fast up until like early afternoon, just cause I find my mental clarity and sharpness is way better doing that. Um, and just eat healthy fats because your nervous system is, is running on fats. Um, and, uh, and just have carbs if you're going to do a hard workout and get your protein. Uh, you know, it's, I think a lot of people overcomplicate things based on the latest fad and the latest trend um, and develop like these anxiety problems when they fall off and, and kind of beat themselves up a little bit too much. Um, so I would, you can't go wrong sticking with hydration. People are chronically dehydrated and they don't even realize it. So definitely drink more water. Um, and also just get whole food sources in your diet. Like if it's in, in a box, then try to avoid it. Um, I try and keep it very simple, especially for patients who are uh, kind of on the fitness and nutrition kick for the first time, because a lot of times it can be very anxiety provoking. Uh, so I try not to, to go by like diets. I just try and go by uh, whole foods, drink water, sleep well, like keep it, keep it very simple. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good way to go about that. And it's very true. It's all about the mind again. Um, I guess we'll end with one last question. Um, and we kind of talked about this before the session, but um, is there any advice that you have for us as, you know, we're hopefully nearing the end of this pandemic, but still in the middle of it as college pre-med students or post back students? Mm -hmm. I would say follow your passion and your gut. Um, Certainly there's a lot of people uh, during my journey who, who would be like, are you really going to do OMM? Like, uh, what even is that? Like, uh, you know, can you specialize in that? Or, and, and ultimately, I have zero regrets because I'm, I pursued this based on the skill set that I have, the talents that I have to help other people. And becoming a physician is really not supposed to be this, like, super lofty like get rich and look really good and be like you're really a servant to your patients like it's it's a very humbling position um but it's in my opinion the most rewarding and most fulfilling profession available because you're changing people's lives every day and you're making a living doing that which is a privilege um and the best way for you to to do that to the fullest is to pursue something that you feel in your core, in your spirit, let's say that is, that is right for you. So for me, it was using my hands to help people and learning osteopathy and, and spreading knowledge about what has helped me so much in my life to help others. Um, for one of my best friends, Chris, who's a surgical resident, his calling was surgery. He is a surgeon through and through. He loves doing surgery. And that's his gift and his thing that he pursued because of his passions, regardless of the people who, who thought he was crazy for getting half a million in student debt, um, the people who told him he couldn't because he had to do a post back and take the MCAT multiple times. And now he's, he's going to be a general surgeon. So um, I think the, the thing to let everyone know is to just, um, is to just pursue what you want. Try not to listen to all the naysayers and uh, just really find the best way that you can provide healing to others um, and you'll be happy and successful. Again, thank you so much for this presentation. There's, if you open up the chat, you can see that people are literally saying that you've changed their future plans and that they're, after those, they're going to add DO schools to their application lists. So thank you so much for providing your personal cool. experience and perspective, it's so appreciated. Yeah, I mean, this is why I do this, because if I had known about DO school and osteopathy and, and how it could help people, um, I would have had a much simpler <laughs> application process, so to speak. Like my, my whole journey would have been like much, much more smooth. Um, but again, like this is, this is why I do this, because it, you guys are the future you're going to be actually advocating for physicians and helping patients in this next generation. Um, so I'm just happy you guys invited me on. And uh, if you wanted to learn more about my personal background and, and that journey to get to where I am talking to you guys right now, um, my YouTube video comes out at like in two hours. Uh, so just check that out. 
it shows actually a little bit about, I actually gave another Zoom lecture last week, so I recorded it um, where they talk a little bit more about my personal background. And then uh, I, I showcase my uh, art, the store where I sell artwork and where I like meet with people who are interested in my artistic pursuits. So yeah, just check it out and always message me um, on Instagram or just, you know, contact me if you have any more questions, because I'm here to be a resource for you guys and to just help uh, in any way I can, honestly. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and put your